Good morning, everyone. I am Stefan Meyer. I am going to be the facilitator for this uh, webinar. And um, I have been the facilitator for some of you that have been participating in this series of webinars, so you might be familiar. So today's topic is going to be towards a green recovery. We're talking about this uh, green uh, recovery and uh, which uh, are going to be the experiences in Central America and the Caribbean in the, this uh, scenario. And um, we are going to have approximately a couple of hours. We have simultaneous interpreting which means that um, you can uh, choose uh, the language to the left side of your screen. You can choose uh, the language that you want to listen to. It's, you can listen to the floor where you see the icon with the headsets. You find a button with the headset uh, on the left hand side where you can select uh, your uh, language version, which is floor, which is always the original one, English or Spanish. Um, from now on, I will speak in Spanish, so you need to select this option. Um, como les estaba As I was explaining, We're going to talk about green recovery, and uh, we have a plan to have this discussion for a couple of hours. And before taking a look at the agenda and what we have ahead of us, I am going to leave the floor to Lola Mueller, and she is going to have some um, words as introduction for the bilateral cooperation in Costa Rica on the United Nations Division for the 2030 Agenda for Developing Countries and Emerging Economies. She is here with us uh, on behalf of the federal um, government in uh, cooperation and uh, nuclear safety. So Lola, the floor is yours for some welcoming remarks. Good morning, Lola. Sorry again for the technical uh, difficulties. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here today. Um, as you very well know, the current pandemic clearly highlighted the correlation between nature conservation and the protection of human health. To mitigate the risk of future pandemics, we therefore need to conserve biodiversity and protect ecosystems more effectively. While overcoming the pandemic, it is essential that the mobilized public funds are channeled into forward-looking sectors that prevent lock-in effects. Um, it's important to not undermine the achievements of the Paris Agreement in order to avoid dead ends, um, economically speaking. We need a transformation towards greener and carbon-neutral societies. A recent study highlighted that um, gave fact-based evidence that climate action is not at odds with, with economic growth. It's a study that has been published by the Oxford University and UNEP. On the contrary, they, they highlight that designing measure, measures um, that are compatible with environmental and social interests provide also strong and effective impetus for growth and employment. That is the message that we have to bring forward. Unfortunately, it seems that especially developing countries and emerging markets have difficulties setting up such plans, either because of budgetary restriction or because of burdening credit lines or simply political will. On this note, I would like to highlight that the BMU does not does give a lot of attention and importance to international partnerships with those countries in order to foster a green recovery and is willing to help countries as, for example, through the Partnership for Action of a Green Economy, which I'm very happy will today present its results um, on different work streams that have been put forward in the SECA region. On this note, and without further ado, I'd like to give over back to the moderator and thank uh, very much for this um, for this for this event. 
Uh, I won't be staying, unfortunately, for the discussion, but I wish a lovely um, exchange. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now we're going to see what we had ahead of us for today. We have um, a very interesting um, agenda looking at different aspects and we are going to start with a, a look at the concept of green recovery in the case of uh, Barbados uh, where we are going to have Giuliano Montanari and Donna Keane Rethway telling us uh, about what they have been working on the green recovery in Barbados. And uh, afterwards, we are going to take a look at a series of green recovery for practitioners. And um, I think that um, Samira now um, is going to tell us with Mara Bila telling us about this whole series and before we move on to a discussion panel with people that are going to tell us about the different aspects about this green recovery that we need to take into account and the different experiences that we have from different projects and different stakeholders that are currently working on this topic and uh, this is going to be basically what um, we'll be discussing mainly. And uh, you can uh, ask uh, questions and uh, we're going to have a more open discussion. And before we move on to the closing remarks uh, before 10 p.m. Costa Rican time, as I was saying, we we are going to use this uh, voice boxer tool. So the questions uh, from the audience or any comments that you might have, uh, please uh, use the chat for this uh, purpose and uh, we'll address uh, these uh, questions and we'll send them to the speakers uh, during um, this event. And, um, and then um, I will we'll, um, give the floor to Giuliano Montanari and Donna Kin. And uh, Giuliano is a designer or all the topics related to green recoveries, uh, green finance, green trade, fiscal reform, uh, industrial uh, policies. And he plays a very important role on the first uh, forum on um, green learning and that took place in Paris. And prior to that, he worked for many years on the private sector on the, the different areas for the development with the HIZ in Mozambique and the Heinrich Bird Foundation in Cambodia. And he has a licensure degree and a master's degree in political science from the Berlin University. And uh, he works on the monetary, current monetary system. That, that is something that we currently overlook when it comes to sustainability. And uh, he works with uh, Donna Marie King, the National Coordinator the Alliance for Action on Green Economy and um, he, supported by the United Nations as a national coordinator supporting the Ministry of the Environment from Barbados uh, when it comes to planning and implementation of uh, workflows supported by PAGE that go all the way from learning related to green economies. And she has also been an environmental educator for the government of Barbados with a considerable experience on the facilitator of activities aimed at sustainable development and community level. And when it comes to education as part of this, the steering technical committee on green economies on the government working on uh, green economies on the government uh, of Barbados and uh, from uh, NUMA and the uh, UNDP. And now I would like to give the floor to Giuliano for um, his uh, presentation. Oh, 
I'm going to speak in English since also my colleague Donna here, who's from Barbados, also speaks in English. So we'll, we'll do this as a team, this presentation. Uh, I'm not sure, Stefan, can we see our page presentation or do I basically? Okay, here it is. Okay, great. So on behalf of the Partnership for Action on Green Economy, good morning, good afternoon to everyone from Montevideo, Uruguay. I imagine some of you started today with uh, a delicious uh, gallo pinto, which I haven't had uh, in a long time. Um, for those who don't know, PAGE is a UN initiative that was founded in the aftermath of the Rio Plus 20 conference. Uh, it uh, has the five agencies that you see at the bottom, so that's uh, UNEP, ILO, UNDP, UNIDO, and UNITAR. So before starting the actual presentation, uh, we would like to thank GIZ and partners also for giving us this space today. As we don't have much time, I'd suggest we jump right into the topic of today. So this presentation has three objectives. So first we want to outline what is meant by green recovery, where it comes from and what it entails. And here I would just like to share a brief caveat. Uh, we won't be able to go into much detail today, so please accept any simplifications and generalizations during this presentation. Secondly, we describe how PAGE is reflecting green recovery in its global operations and national programs together with partner countries. And finally, Donna will present the experience of Barbados. So what is a green recovery actually? So we can start with a working definition. That is, green recovery can be understood as a package of fiscal and regulatory reforms with a strong emphasis on environmental and socioeconomic considerations with the objective to recover better from the COVID-19 pandemic. The goal of green recovery is clearly not to simply return to the pre-crisis situation, if not to create long-term prosperity. Uh, and here it's also important to note that there's no single definition of green recovery. In fact, there are many organizations and platforms that promote the idea with different emphases and interests. We have, for example, the International Monetary Fund, who has been vocal about green recovery. So is the OECD and also this uh, important politician here that I'm sure everyone knows. So let's ask ourselves, where does green recovery actually come from? And here we can say that the idea of green recovery is not entirely new. Uh, it was actually, there were actually uh, similar concepts that emerged in the wake of the last big crisis, the 2007-08 global financial crisis and subsequent government responses. So there were already, say, academic uh, or, or research uh, related to this, uh, say, idea of a sustainable uh, recovery as promoted by the ILO, for example with the green stimulus idea or the global green new deal uh, promoted by UNEP which has been recycled now by some key policymakers in the US actually but then there have been also been national champions such as South Korea who uh, invested a significant portion of their recovery spending on yeah sustainability or green economy green economy there may have been actually earlier say ideas around sustainable recovery however they were only debated at the margins of global policy debates. Now, there's one fundamental problem here. That is, the environmental and socioeconomic performance of countries more or less continued the pre-crisis trends after a short bump after the last crisis. In other words, the green stimuli did not have enough traction and or scale to significantly change the course of society's development traje trajectories. This is uh, shown, for example, by some key global and regional metrics, such as, for example, global GHG, greenhouse gas emissions. And here I would like you to focus on this little bump here in, in 2008-2009. We, we, saw, we saw a short decline, but then after basically the economy returned to normal, so did also the the greenhouse gas emission trends. This applies also to, say, the environmental footprint more generally, as shown in the, the data of the Global Environment Footprint Network. But also this is reflected in, say, uh, economic inequality uh, data, 
here we can see again like a short bump uh, in major economies but then basically the long-term trend continued afterwards and my apologies here that I only have the, the advanced economies but there were similar trends in all of the regions of the world actually now one can ask is this time actually different and we at page believe that the answer is to a significant degree yes in 2020 the world entered the global crisis the pandemic under a different much more urgent context on the one hand we have more comprehensive international frameworks and agreements for sustainable development uh, think for example the agenda 2030 we have also climate change frameworks such as the Paris Agreement, biodiversity frameworks and many more commitments on the one hand. However, on the other hand, we observe an alarming underperformance, non-compliance with environmental targets and commitments. Meanwhile, ecosystems around the world keep deteriorating. So we see an even greater disconnect between those two uh, dimensions compared to the last crisis. Now, however, despite the grim environmental outlook pre-COVID, the imposed lockdowns and resulting economic slowdown presented some desirable environmental incomes, uh, outcomes. Sorry. And here the question obviously is if those environmental outcomes will actually be temporary or uh, permanent. For example, we can see that um, uh, air pollution levels in mega cities such as uh, Bangkok or Buenos Aires uh, decreased significantly at the peak of the, the lockdowns. Uh, we have seen before that the global GHG emissions uh, declined rapidly uh, last year. But then we've also uh, some other effects that uh, may be a bit more humorous, like uh, perhaps uh, wildlife uh, reclaiming habitats in cities, uh, or also some uh, basically water systems in places like Venice, or Sao Paulo that uh, became clear uh, suddenly, even uh, after uh, multiple policy attempts over decades to kind of clean up the waters, but now actually the lockdown managed to do what policymakers could do in, in a lot of decades. So the COVID-19 crisis has proven doubters and skeptics wrong in one very significant way, that is societies can actually drastically change in a short time span and here uh, the critical question the critical choice that societies face actually is whether that change in the future will be by design or by disaster obviously we at page believe that it should be by design now what does green recovery actually entail uh, here the united nations under the leadership of the secretary general published two key reports in the spring of last year to tackle the COVID-19 crisis. And this UN framework lays out a blueprint to seize this window of opportunity that came out of the crisis to depart from business as usual and lay the foundation for long-term prosperity. And here I just extracted two quotes that, quotes that point basically uh, at the fact that uh, the, the COVID-19 crisis is not only a health crisis, if not also a crisis that uh, is an expression of an unsustainable economic model, as you can see here in this first quote. And also the second quote points towards the necessity of fiscal and financial response, uh, responses uh, to basically achieve a transformational and green recovery. In terms of the characteristics of this con concept, it's important to state that uh, green recovery does not represent a one-size-fits-all solution nor a panacea for all problems that we have and had pre-COVID-19. Um, the concept does acknowledge that each society faces a distinct set of national circumstances, challenges and opportunities whilst addressing the crisis. And that means that policy responses will vary to a significant degree on uh, depending on local conditions and resources. Uh, for example, this can be related, for example, to the composition of the GDP of a certain country or income levels trade patterns, natural resource bases, energy matrices, all these different conditions that um, basically uh, present the idea that you should or you cannot actually always prescribe the same static set of policies to overcome the crisis. This is certainly what we don't do at PAGE. We're very aware of this um, idea that uh, countries need 
country-specific responses. Now, in terms of the, the actual kind of like tenets of the, the green recovery, I just uh, presented here 10 priority options in the following uh, slide uh, that are promoted by major international organizations such as the OECD, PAGE, but also GIZ and the Green Growth Knowledge Partnership. Here I just compiled basically those 10 priority options. We won't have time to go into the detail today, but basically I just wanted to highlight a few key ideas such as over using overarching principles, such as planetary boundaries or efficiency, efficiency to guide policy responses, uh, and not only focus basically on, uh, say, expanding uh, the quantitative uh, base of the economy or just focusing on, it, on economic growth, for example. But we also have the idea of uh, recognizing the role of nature, uh, basically using strong social protection mechanisms, accelerating the energy transition, uh, not forgetting also the role of gender. Uh, as we know, many women have been basically sent back to kind of like traditional roles as a result of the, the lockdowns, but also um, the idea to prioritize small and informal enterprises. Again, uh, we don't have the time to go into detail, but this is just to give you a, a very short uh, overview. Now, how does PAGE actually uh, put green recovery to work in our daily actions? So PAGE has been quite quick uh, and concerted to support countries in crafting green recovery plans. I have presented here a few examples. Um, here it's important to also highlight the additional green recovery funds that PAGE has received on behalf of the the generous support from the uh, German government, which uh, PAGE is very grateful for. This is a big help in strengthening uh, countries' responses in the mid and long term. Um, basically, what we have presented at the very beginning, we have done a series of rapid impact and needs assessments to see, okay, what are actually the most pressing issues the countries are facing right now and what could be po possible policy entry points to respond to the crisis. We have um, assembled a so-called COVID-19 hub with a data observatory where we collect data on not only the impacts in terms of employment, trade, GDP, but also we compiled uh, an overview of countries' policy responses in the areas of, for example, monetary policy, employment, social protection, and so forth. We have engaged in a, a big exercise also with um, Cambridge Econometrics to model certain uh, economic responses, comparing them, for example, uh, green recovery spending with, say, the business as usual, or we have like different scenarios depending on how much, uh, what proportion of the green recovery spending would actually go to sustainable sustainability goals. We have also uh, uh, engaged in a global campaign uh, on green, learning for a green recovery. The page actually has a series of free uh, and self-paced uh, online courses for policymakers and the broader public to learn about green recovery and uh, the, the policy toolbox, for example. So with that uh, being said, I would hand over to uh, Donna to present a case study of uh, Barbados. Thank you very much. Thank you, Giuliano. Good day, everyone. And uh, let me first of all say thank you for the opportunity to share Barbados's experience with COVID. I have supplied you with some statistics, but just let me say at the outset, in terms of being a small island developing state, Barbados follows quite closely the Samoa pathway, which now uh, takes the view more closely um, to what happens to small island developing states, especially in a time such as this with the COVID pandemic. Just for a bit of background and very quickly, um, if you look at paragraph 25 of the Samoa pathway, green economy is announced as an important tool in the context of sustainable development and poverty eradication. And therefore, as well as paragraph 68, where the notion of sustainable consumption and production for promoting sustainable development is seen as a requirement. So I just wanted to put that in the context of where Barbados is going in terms of its recovery. Unfortunately for us, we have seen 37, I think at the moment that number now probably stands at about 39 deaths from COVID. Do appreciate that our population is quite small, 287,000 people. Um, uh, we have had, though, some success in vaccinating persons with the, um, with the vaccination process for COVID. Uh, we've so far reached over 50,000 persons 
who have received the vaccine. And we are hoping, of course, to move towards, um, what do they call it? Herd immunity in the context of Barbados. We have also suffered many restrictions, many lockdowns, and this has hit us very hard in terms of how we deal with a small island developing state, a small country with a small economy. So you can imagine that as a tourist dependent country, we have now lost uh, an enormous amount of income because our tourism industry is basically at a standstill. Um, just to provide some stats for you, our National Insurance um, Office, which is uh, a, a scheme which is developed to support um, persons who are unemployed, etc., one, one of our safety nets, they have paid out in the last year 77, over 77 million U.S. dollars in unemployment benefits. That's between March 2020 and the beginning of March this year. In addition to that, as I said, many people are unemployed, especially those within the context of the tourism sector. And Barbados is having a pretty um, significant, because of the lockdowns and the shutdowns, we are seeing commerce almost at a standstill. Many small businesses and even our informal sector persons are without work. Many people have lost their jobs. Um, there is considerable hardship, but the government is seeking, along with its partners, to address the basic needs of those who are currently unemployed. So yes, and let's add to all of this with COVID, Barbados as a small island developing state continues to be under threat from climate change. <clears throat> so in terms of, oops, sorry. Okay, great. So in terms of Barbados's attempt to address these, these issues as a small island developing state, and as I've said to you, we are ba basically, we have adopted a green economy as well as a blue economy for further development and for us to attain sustainable development. And in the context of our green recovery, we thought that it would be important to, to focus on circular and a five R's clean and green philosophy, which looks at recovery in the context of consumption and production that is sustainable. So first of all, we are looking to develop a framework which builds on our current solid waste um, uh, policy, as well as all of the green economy principles that Barbados has already been inst instituting. It is important that we look after our waste. Waste has so many impacts on a small island developing state. If, for example, we have a, a landfill, which is basically at, its, at the end of its days. So what do we do with our waste? So it means that we have to ensure that not only do we have the policies in place for better waste management, but that those policies um, are seen to be taken on by just about every sector on island so that our development can be seen to be a clean development, yes, but also that we take into consideration that as moving towards green economy, we have got to address waste in a very frontal way. In terms of small, medium, and uh, micro enterprises, I've just outlined for you the loss of business hours, the loss of income. We see that it is important, especially for our recovery, that we integrate the notion of circularity and resource efficiency into the processes that all of these businesses will be in, engaged in. We want to ensure that in spite of the hardship, that when we recover or or our production levels could increase, but more importantly, that we also are mindful of environmental impacts and all of the considerations that we, we need to focus on through small business and how we develop new business in the context of recovery. We also see that citizen engagement and education are key. As, as was mentioned in my introduction, I am this very big on education. There is no point in sharing or trying to transition to a green and blue economy without our people coming with us, without the citizens having a fair understanding of why we are doing what we are doing. And so through the, the green recovery process um, and the proposal that has been so well laid out through 
um, much of our stakeholder consultation, very wide stakeholder consultation. And again, I say thank you to the German government for its generosity in ensuring that PAGE can carry this sort of green response, green recovery response in the context of Barbados. So we see that, imp that it's very important for our citizens to understand and to embrace sustainable lifestyles. When we speak to our 5R practice, we are looking at reducing, reusing, recycling, which are very common um, across the world. And in the context of Barbados, we are also looking at recovery. What can we recover from any of our waste that can be reused in such a way that it will make things more viable and also be positively impacting us from an economic standpoint? And last of all, repair. Rather than be a throwaway society, Barbados imports just about everything from food to vehicles to clothing. We need to make sure that we are very mindful of our economic spend and therefore looking at what we can do from a repair perspective, as this will support, um, support us in recovering as we go forward. And last of all, ensuring that our professionals in the environmental sector that they too are receiving the latest professional training for public sector individuals so that in terms of creating the kinds of policies or enhancing existing green economy policies, that they are at the forefront of carrying the whole recovery process as well. Um, so from a Barbados perspective, as I've said, the green economy principles for small island developing states remains extremely important for us. In addition to that, there is a focus on the youth. The youth are our future. And in terms of our long-term planning, because it's not just about uh, it's not just about reviewing where or, or going back to business as usual, we have got to get our young people in the front seat in terms of innovation and in terms of creating opportunities that allow us to recover in a very green way. Barbados has also set a target for transitioning to uh, through its energy transition by 2030 to become a fully renewable energy space, so to speak. And that is something that we will continue to work towards and support government on in terms of, of PAGE and the green economy process. And as I've said, our priority, um, we are prioritizing micro, medium and small enterprises as we look forward. So. Uh, to a green economy transition. So that's it in a nutshell. Our proposal, again, our green recovery proposal, proposal seeks to embed the idea of circularity and a five R's philosophy in the context of how Barbados recovers from a consumption and production perspective. And I hope that I've been clear. And please, if you've got any questions, please share them with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Donna. Uh, thank you, Giuliano. Um, for muchas gracias, Donna. Muchas gracias, Giuliano, para este para este. Thanks, Donna. Thanks, Giuliano, for your presentation. This is the introduction to the green recovery context and the approach of uh, PAGE initiative. And in this specific case uh, of Barbados. Uh, so with that, uh, we're going to move to the next uh, point of the agenda. So we're going to listen to the presentation of the series Green Recovery for, Practi for Practitioners. I invite uh, Mara Biller and Samira Hackman to give uh, the presentation. Mara is an uh, advisor of Green Recovery in GIZ. Her project, the support project funded by Vicky for design and implementation of the new global framework uh, um, bioframe, uh, working with uh, partner countries uh, for restoration of ecosystems uh, as an integrated part of the programs and activities of economic recovery. And Samira, she is a junior advisor of GIZ in the global project, a project to support the implementation of the Paris Agreement implemented by GIZ on behalf of EMO within the International Climate Initiative. Samira works in affairs related to GIZ, and I give the floor to Samira for her presentation. 
Thank you so much, Stefan, um, and also a warm hello from our side, um, and apologies from my side for the technical issues in the beginning. Um, we are very happy to join all of you from Berlin, where we are based, both of us working for GIZ Global Projects, um, as Stefan said, um, and both of us in projects advising BMU, the German Environmental Ministry. And uh, we were very excited to learn about this webinar on green recovery um, a while back, as this is a topic with both of which both of our projects have started working on over the past year. And uh, we were even more excited about the opportunity to present part of our work here today. Um, and what we will present to you now is a publication series that we are currently developing as a contribution to the economic advisory initiative of the NDC partnership. Um, some of you may know this initiative already, some may not. Um, I will not present it right now, as Amanda McKee from the NDC Partnership is here today and will tell us more about it. And we also have Philip Dalsu with us, who is currently working as an embedded advisor in St. Lucia. So I'm really looking forward also to hearing from them. And um, now I have to see how I can go to the next slide. Perfect. Ah, can we go to the next one, please? Sorry, I think it wasn't me. Um, okay, uh, so we launched a publication series called Green Recovery for Practitioners a while back um, as a contribution to the work of the economic advisors that are currently um, embedded in various ministries and countries all over the world. Um, Amanda and uh, Philip will tell us more about it later. And um, what we did was to set out to develop three products specifically for this initiative. Um, and uh, yeah, um, maybe just again a word also on our, on our partners next to the SPA project where I'm working in Bioframe where MANA is based at. Um, our partners are the EuroClima Plus uh, project funded by the European Union and also the think tank E3G. And um, we set out to, to develop a series of three products. The first one um, being a practical framework uh, called Setting the Course Towards a Sustainable, Inclusive and Resilient Transformation. And um, we published this in January. And um, the idea behind this um, publication was to, to, to start out from what do practitioners need to put a green recovery into practice? Um, and so this publication contains various arguments for green recovery and practical lists of, of possible outcomes, stakeholders and tools and examples that can be drawn upon for green recovery planning. And um, the second product that Mara will tell us more about in a bit is a collection of current green recovery measures that may serve as an inspiration to all of us who are currently working on green recovery planning. And the third product um, will be a deep dive on the financial sector and will look into different avenues for engaging particularly financial stakeholders like finance ministries or central banks, for example, in a green recovery. Um, and so with that, I will go a bit deeper into the first product, the practical framework. And with that, maybe we can, thank you very much. Um, and so, as I said, the starting point for this publication was essentially the question, what do practitioners need to get from ambitions to actions when talking of a green recovery? And so the study lists powerful arguments for conv convincing others of why a green recovery imp is important, um, such as um, high public support, um, and of course many other arguments from a climate perspective that are very prominent to you but again are, are really valuable to have in this context that the economic advisors are, are acting in. Um, and other questions that guided the development were how socioeconomic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic can be assessed um, because we saw that this is an interest or a need um, that's very present in many ministries at the moment of course. Um, and then also to say, okay, what are possible outcomes that planners should, should consider or strive for um, when looking at green recovery measures? 
um, and who are central stakeholders that should be engaged in such pro uh, processes. And then possibly most interesting to all of you, um, uh, what are current tools and approaches that planners can consider and what are examples to draw upon. Um, and so we decided to focus the presentation on, on this part today and with that um, I hand over to Mara for, for the second half of the presentation. Okay, perfect. Many thanks. Um, can I ask you maybe to jump to the next slide, please? Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, hi everyone, also from my side. Um, we're very grateful for this opportunity to present our study in this uh, web seminar. I would like to talk about um, tools and approaches we identified that can be considered for a green recovery before highlighting some examples or um, snapshots as we like as we like to call them from Latin America and the Caribbean that we've included um, in the upcoming second publication. And maybe again, firstly, as Giuliano has already said, it is important to note that there is really no one size fits all solution. So decision makers must choose uh, the best suited policy tools depending on national circumstances. And another um, preliminary comment that cannot be stressed enough is that a key element for the quick adoption of green recovery measures is to utilize and build on measures and structures that existed and ideally functioned uh, well already before the pandemic. So um, one important entry point, and this brings us to the first of six categories we used in the study, is the alignment and reform of national, regional and uh, local planning. This could be uh, sustainable development, biodiversity and climate strategies, green growth roadmaps, um, or macroeconomic and infrastructure planning. Another interesting approach under this category is the consideration of alternative metrics to define economic progress being introduced, for example, in New Zealand with its wellness index or um, in Amsterdam and other cities that embrace a so-called donut economics model for um, cities post-pandemic recovery. Secondly, we looked at various economic, monetary and fiscal measures that could be deployed by finance and planning ministries, by central banks, as well as investment and um, development banks. To name just a few, such measures could be designing sustainable public procurement uh, instruments, uh, integrating risk and resilience considerations into macroeconomic management, considering green solidarity-based tax reforms, launching green bonds and other finance products, or uh, adopting so-called exclusion lists for investment in high carbon projects. The third category is uh, just transition and employment and includes supporting public work programs and green sectors, improving education and training in green skills, or improving inclusion and decision-making capacities of marginalized groups and indigenous communities. Ethiopia, for, for instance, launched um, back in August 2020, a recovery program that focuses on nature-based solutions for water infrastructure and community resilience with a strong focus on rural women and girls. In the fourth category, local action and sustainable urban development, a range of approaches is featured, such as expanding sustainable transport and other public infrastructure, improving health and living conditions by creating green spaces or fostering public um, green public procurement. I will elaborate on the example of cycling infrastructure in cities around the world shortly. Fifth, and sometimes, of course, overlapping with, uh, with the categories I've just mentioned, we looked at nature-based solutions that support biodiversity and sustainable agriculture, including mitigation activities such as forest preservation, afforestation or peatland protection, 
enhancing ecosystem-based adaptation, fostering climate smart and biodiversity friendly agriculture, um, or supporting sustainable fisheries and ecotourism aligned with biodiversity conservation. Now, the final category includes approaches related to international cooperation and financing. And these are a little more, let's say, programmatic in nature, um, such as enhancing international and regional coordination, engaging international creditors to negotiate uh, debt for climate or debt for nature swaps, or building alliances around sustainable finance, including green taxonomies. And maybe again, um, to conclude this part, I would like to, to stress that, of course, um, periodic reviews and readjustments of measures, like the ones that I have just mentioned, are necessary, and that peer-to-peer -peer learning, as it is happening um, in this event today, is, is crucial. With that, I would now like to move on to our last slide, please. Thank you. And uh, with this one, just give you a glimpse into the upcoming Green Recovery Snapshot Collection that we hope to publish within the next month. And we've really moved away from the more qualitative term good or even best practice, because in, in most cases, it is simply too early to assess the impact and, and potential benefits of the discussed examples. And what we aim to do in this collection is really to, to just take a look at around 20 to 25 examples of how a green recovery could be implemented on the ground and hopefully provide some inspiration for green recovery planners around the world. And um, many activities are rooted in pre-pandemic initiatives which refers again to what I've said in the beginning, and I, I believe others as well already, um, about not really not reinventing the wheel and, and building on existing green economy approaches. Now, looking at the time, I think I will keep this very short and maybe just pick two of our snapshots. I'm sure that later in the panel, we will hear more about the first example featured here, about integrating green recovery elements into Costa Rica's national policies and planning, such as the country's decarbonization plan and the recently presented strategy for an inclusive and decarbonized economy until 2050, which is, from our point of view, a really good example for mainstreaming green recovery into existing national policy. And another snapshot is on urban cycling infrastructure in Colombia, Chile, Argentina, and other countries. Um, the COVID pandemic has really demonstrated the importance of individual and, and safe options for commuting in urban areas. And the region of, of Latin America and the Caribbean has one of the highest rates of growth in transport CO2 emissions with a 50% increase between 2000 and 2016. And so the pandemic really opened a window of opportunity to shift towards more sustainable, low emission means of transport, which many cities embraced by installing or by improving the quality of cycling infrastructure. And it will now just really be important to make sure this, this infrastructure is not just pop up, um, but that it becomes permanent and is also accompanied by sensibilization measures to encourage people to change their mobility behavior in, in the long term. I think I will leave it at that and uh, would just like to invite you to take a look at the Green Recovery for Practitioner series yourself for more inspiring example. Yeah, so um, many thanks for your attention and please do reach out to us in case of questions or if you have suggestions for further snapshots um, that we could include. And with that, back over to Stefan. Thank you. Muchas gracias, uh, Samira. Muchas gracias, Mara. Uh, um, muy interesante, digamos, este insight. In, in, uh... Thank you, Samira and Mara.
and now we're going to take it some time to get to know a little bit more in detail. And now we are going to continue with our discussion panel and I would like to invite uh, David uh, as a moderator. He is an advisor in um, climatic planning with the GIC in Costa Rica, a graduate in international relations from National University in Costa Rica, and specializing in sustainable financing from Cathy. From uh, 2018, he has been working with a climatic financing component on the Axion Clima project. And um, I would like to invite uh, David as uh, the presenter for this uh, discussion panel. And I would like to remind you that if you have uh, questions for the panel members, please use uh, the general chat and uh, then we'll address uh, the questions. So David, the floor is yours and good morning. Thank you and good morning everyone. And thank you to everyone in the region and our colleagues in Germany and uh, in Europe. And for me and for the Axion Clima Project, it's an honor to be able to share this space with you. It is a very important and particularly now where we have many questions and doubts, and this is precisely the idea for this space to get to see it and discuss with representatives of different governments and initiatives to tell us about your plans, because we have been listening to our colleagues from Germany. It's maybe too soon to get to know the impact of all these measures. However, we had great news. And uh, this is what we're going to listen to now as part of our welcoming remarks. I would like to tell you that uh, recently the um, United Nations program from the environment, uh, we have uh, some news uh, about uh, how we are going to bridge uh, this uh, gap uh, because we're going to learn about the uh, the current behavior and all the gaps uh, from the, the countries now and we have uh, some news about who, where we need to go regarding temperature and if we analyze uh, the current reports even though the emissions from 2020 were lower and we have of course uh, some things in response to the COVID we still uh, foresee that the this is going to be some effects that are going to be insignificant in the long run. However, in spite of uh, this uh, news that we just uh, received, the measures that we have for this uh, re recovery that countries are looking forward are going to be very significant. And this is the space to establish this uh, transformation for these uh, low carbon emissions that are really necessary towards this uh, transformation for this uh, scenario that we really need. And this is where we really need to head to. So we, it is really important in order to reduce this gap. And this is why we have this discussion panel where we want to reflect this uh, moment for the Central American and Caribbean region and we're going to analyze the Costa Rican case because uh, decarbonization is a, a sensible response uh, even if we are not if we were not in the presence of this uh, pandemic and uh, we need to analyze uh, this uh, in the long term and we need to tend to things like unemployment as a result of this pandemic and then we have this partnership in representation of uh, other partnerships and we need concrete actions to move from ideas to action. And uh, finally, this is something that we need to apply in solution the Caribbean with a very interesting and uh, promising case. And having said that, it is an honor to introduce the members of the panel. And I would like to ask each of you to activate uh, your video as I introduce you. So I 
have the honor to have Olegario Science Batalla, Director of uh, Analysis and Development and Economic Policy in Costa Rica. Olegario is, has a licensed degree in economics from University of Costa Rica in charge of analysis uh, from the Ministry of Planning. He has participated in the in planning development for many years now, as he is a professor and courses in economics, in microeconomics, and use of data. And recently, he has actively participated in the preparation of economic strategies for the decarbonization of economics and or the national strategic plan. Olegario, welcome and good morning. And we also have Agrippina Jenkins, advisor of the NDC support program, part of the UNDP. Agrippina he is in international relations in relation to climate change since 2014. And since 2016, he's been an advisor in the direction of climate change from INAI, part of the negotiations of climate change for the negotiation of uh, global goals. And since uh, 2018 is the program uh, coordinator on the advances and implementation of uh, climate change on the uh, different countries. Welcome Agrippina and thank you for being here. And I also have the honor of sharing this space with Amanda McKean, the head of uh, knowledge um, and uh, or CAEP from the NDC partnership and she's in charge of uh, support of Congress from the INDC partnership for, na for nationally determined contributions, which we concluded in uh, 2020. She spent uh, a long part of her career to promote learning in um, to address all the challenges uh, in relation to a uh, sustainable development and also green recovery. And thank you for being with us. And uh, Philippe Dalsou, economic deputy economic advisor. And uh, we'll get to know more about this embedded advisor for St. Lucia in the Caribbean. He recently retired from public administration in St. Lucia last year. And um, he held uh, important positions uh, and permanent secretary for the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of uh, Public Function and the very important positions of the Ministry of uh, Economic uh, Administration. So we have a very important uh, discussion panel at the highest level, I would say, with um, many important insights from uh, different uh, parts uh, of the world. So I think that this is a uh, great and I think that we can start. I would like to start uh, because we have uh, heard the concept of on behalf of our peers uh, from a uh, page, uh, we have uh, heard about the analysis or, or the instruments uh, about the different measures uh, or whom should I go to when I need to get some information about uh, green recovery in practice. But now I would like to know about the Costa Rican case. The Costa Rican case is very interesting for many reasons. And I think that one of the most important reasons or the ones that we have heard most from is about the decarbonization plan that was launched before the pandemic. And um, I think that this is something that we can take into consideration, not only because this uh, is going to shed a light or some hope, because I think that in spite of this pandemic, this is going to give us the context because it's a, a tool because they, the, I would like to ask Agrippina about the support that they have from the NDC support program and I'd like to know about the elements that they have identified that are going to contribute to green recovery because this was launched before the pandemic. So thank you Agrippina. Thank you, David. It's uh, an honor to be a part of this panel. Thank you for the invitation. It is always a pleasure to be able to share with our colleagues, not only from Costa Rica, Olegario, but uh, from the NDC partnership, and of course, and Lucia. The NDC support program that, as you say, is uh, from the UNDP, 
I think that we have been supporting a process that uh, keeps on going and it's very important. So this is a first uh, is a decarbonization plan that we have been working on with our support and we are currently analyzing how this uh, decarbonization plan is going to be one of the routes for green recovery and this is not something that we take for granted this is uh, something that we're currently working on and this is how we're going to continue with the green recovery of the country and I would like to mention that uh, we are talking about this decarbonization plan that is going to be a long-term strategy for the 2050 vision that we have. But I would like to clarify that the country sees this ambition hand in hand with a, a way to adapt because there is much that has been said about this decarbonization plan at national and international level. But we need to know that this is a two-way highway and we need to adapt first regarding this a climate ambition so that we can close a complete cycle. So this analysis towards this a green recovery is going to shed some results uh, by mid-June of this year. And I think that this is the framework of the support of the UNDP of this uh, promise, that this is the climate promise that we are going to have for all these pro processes and not necessarily or specifically for all countries in the same way. But the country made a very interesting decision by saying that amidst a pandemic, we need to know what is this green recovery and how we're going to go about it. But as you said, David, this uh, roadmap that is the decarbonization plan started back in 2018 and was completed in 2019. So it was prior to the pandemic. And that is something that we need to know by making the corresponding economic analysis of this process. And we are conducting some modeling that we are currently updating for this decarbonization plan, but we are reviewing this with the different models that we have in our country. So it's important to get to know these results that we will have soon, but what we, we have these, uh, map and we have a cost benefit analysis for the decarbonization plan and of course it's a high cost because we're talking about the economic transformation and the new revolution in economic terms of how the world produces and why it's not only environmental and it's important for you to listen to the ministry of planning because when we talk about this in the country and we hope that this will continue this way because we talk about all sectors it's not just environmental this is the root of how we're going to develop to have a fair transition and we need to be clear about important topics because we are also supporting a gender analysis and climate change because we need more information more data and we need to be clear about how we're going to go about this process and i know that i'm taking more time than i should and david is going to say that it's over but it's important to understand that this decarbonization plan it has a 10 axes covering all the economy and it's divided by the axes that are contributing to the emissions of course the greenhouse if, uh, in gases and also transportation and we need to change the way in which we move or transport ourselves not only well for example electric buses like the german um, uh, government is uh, proposing but we need to change the city models and we are negotiating um, with um, multilateral uh, development banks and climate change is a priority because it, if we don't do it, we're going to have the this investment docks, and uh, that's going to be one of the things that we need to transmit. But uh, maybe in the region, we 
need something that is going to give uh, employment, but we need to generate that. But we don't need to be stag we don't need a stagnation because public investment is quite delicate and it's going to take much more time. So we need to understand that these investments are going to lead us to the new economic stages and new processes that are coming along. And a way to do this and to advance in our small economies is to need to know what's going on and to need what's going on globally hand in hand with sustainable development because science is telling us that this is the only way and or we're going to have stagnation and vulnerability processes that we are familiar with and that we are trying to get rid of. And that's it for me. And if you have any questions, I'm here. Thank you, David. Thank you, Agrippina. I have two phrases that you said that I think are very good. You said that you're not taking anything for granted. And we understand that this decarbonization plan is going to sh shed some light, but you are supporting the government in the update of models that this decarbonization plan was created from. It's important because this is going to provide specific tools to for you to say, okay, you are raising awareness to see what works and what doesn't. It's not just a trend that you are going to follow something that it's in bug because of the pandemic in order to sustain the agenda and the narrative. This is important because I think that this is something that is going to give some tips to other colleagues in the region to understand that this is a process that is scientifically a backed and uh, it's not just it's something that is related to the in to the environment. It is uh, something that uh, is related to the planning of all the economic sectors. And uh, now uh, we'll move on to Jose Olegario, the Costa Rican government launched a a territorial economic strategy towards a, a decarbonized economy in the long run, which we can say that this is the, the first economic development plan for 2050. And um, it's a very interesting because uh, of all of the scientific background that it has uh, all the way since it's uh, planning for the Costa Rican economy for all the sectors. And Olegario can explain it better, but I would like for him to know why it's uh, important uh, in this uh, particular time and how the strategy can be an example for the des to design a strategies in the long term to tend to the caring needs uh, specifically for the pandemic. And welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you. It is an honor to be here sharing with you this uh, space. The economic strategy. Well, I think that this is something that we have uh, been uh, talking about uh, I think that this is a roadmap that the government currently has to present a proposal to change the current development model that we have for the country that I think is concentrated in the greater metropolitan area. And we need to make a change in order to have something that will work in the long term and proposes the growth in 3D digitalized, decarbonized, and decentralized, considering, as I already mentioned, that we have a higher concentration in a productive activity. But this is not just growth in itself. It has to be inclusive and also decarbonized. As it's been said, Costa Rica has been characterized precisely by these things. We're talking about uh, decarbonization with this uh, national plan for 2019 prior to the pandemic, but this is a focus that has always been present as part of our problems. And uh, why? Because uh, the national uh, planning uh, law provides that the Ministry of Planning needs to have a national strategic plan, and this plan should have uh, 
a clear horizon less than 20 years, but, uh, but it was presented before this uh, pandemic. So before 2019, we started with uh, this process and it requires uh, approximately 13 months months of uh, intensive work when it comes to information gathering. Then this information has to be geo-referenced and with the econometric analysis of the different layers of information. I'm talking about 147 layers of different information and uh, hand in hand with an analysis of the um, uh, economic complexity. So I think that this is very robust when it comes to technical information and different uh, analytical elements in order to come up with a proposal. But what does this proposal consist of? Well, this is a territorial economic proposal and I will try to summarize it, but it was a very comprehensive work and I would like to invite you to take a look at the summary of the products on the, the page of the Ministry of National Planning and Economic Policy. But um, if I would have to summarize it into something more simple, it is a new model for Costa Rican development and uh, it would allow to have uh, greater social inclusion and productivity that is lower in, in carbon, I would say, e to be able to consolidate 11 development aspects outside of the greater metropolitan area of our country. And uh, these uh, aspects would be based in three principles economic uh, growth in 3D economy that uh, would need to diversify the economic activities that we currently have and also to improve uh, productivity and to also generate an increase uh, in the different uh, products and services complexity. And this is where we agree with what was proposed before, like strategies and investment proposed by this vision that are going to help build resilience in the different sectors uh, like tourism, agriculture, and uh, also they're going to be the catalyst for innovation and particularly orange economy. But uh, what do we have as another basic element? We cannot grow if we do not have uh, social inclusion considered. So we need to think as a benefit for all the population within the framework of this treaty economy. And uh, in order to attain this, we need to have universal coverage of these conditions for this study, that for these enabling conditions that are going to establish better conditions of life and to prepare people to participate in these complex activities. So we are considering investment in connectivity, for example, that are going to establish the strengthening of all these um, urban rural links and to improve rural mobility and to promote investment in education where we can have uh, different alliances uh, between the academia, the private sector and the government. So this part of so social inclusion is uh, really necessary. And another of these uh, development poles uh, is the decarbonization strategy, the vision for economic growth of uh, Costa Rica. And at the same time, we need to think about reducing these uh, greenhouse effect gases and uh, we need to keep on generating and increasing uh, carbon productivity and also different uh, activities that are less carbon incentive that are linked to this uh, research and also culture and knowledge that are going to contribute to the GDP of the country and energy by generating also decarbonization of the transportation systems. That is one of the sectors that generate more greenhouse effect gases. So the also potential sequestration of a 
these uh, gases are going to result uh, in uh, the coastal ecosystems and forests that are going to be improved by this uh, concept that we have mapped on some areas. So we have all these considerations. And how can we visualize this uh, green recovery in terms of this strategy? Well, let's not forget that this strategy established these temporary horizons in the mid and long term, but not in the short term that we can plan something like this because this strategy is going to establish a transition towards a new model in three points. First, we are going to establish the investment plans in the mid and long term that are going to be necessary in order to close these gaps that have been identified within the country. Gaps, for example, social gaps for a uh, unsatisfied basic gaps, human capital like education, and also digital connectivity that is a fundamental specifically in spaces like the current one, and also road infrastructure that is fundamental in order to establish economic connections that are going to allow to link the different sectors. And I think that this initial investment is going to represent 8.5 of the GDP, approximately. So I think that this is uh, the first uh, phase when it comes to the necessary investment, when it comes to investment, and uh, also the uh, structure for uh, 2050. I think that this uh, vision is going to need uh, six uh, necessary guidance we need to close uh, or bridge gaps. We need to diversify the territory. And third, we need to activate the coasts that are not uh, providing currently all the potential they have in terms of uh, productivity. And it's really important to consider the coasts and also decentralization of uh, innovation that is uh, currently concentrated on the greater metropolitan area because uh, we do not have an innovation scheme that can be decentralized. And another important aspect is to establish a, a system for the corridors that could allow to join the whole ecosystem that is proposed by this strategy and also sustainable employment and also the generation of these types of employments that can consolidate a fundamental aspect in terms of decarbonization by identifying this uh, conglomeration that we can make by using these economic resources that can be georeferenced and uh, we can also have an estimate of uh, current and future activities and also determine the potential of the different territories with a different um, productive activities that we can have along these 11 development poles that are going to be specific points in the national territory that are going to be the generators or the concentrators of all these uh, intersectorial uh, synergies that are going to allow me to produce in a resilient manner and also in a decarbonized and inclusive way. And as for the third stage, and, and, uh, and to complement, we are going to come up with some action plans to define how we're going to do this and what are the specific actions that we are going to take in the mid and long term in each of these territories. And we're going to have five key dimensions, which are going to be social inclusion, human capital, infrastructure and connectivity, and um, 3D economic development and decarbonization. Each of these dimensions are going to establish a group of 10 actions that are going to be key in different uh, sections. For example, for decarbonizations, we can potentiate new renewable energy projects and also biofuels and also renewable energy in coastal areas, uh, promote efficiency in transportation. And when it comes comes to economic development, we can have green economies 
and of course uh, the generation of uh, green uh, employments and also blue employments and this group of 50 key actions uh, can also be reflected in these 11 development polls through a granular focus that are going to establish 155 specific actions. So we're not only going to take these 50 actions at general level, but we're going to also have these 75 actions on the different development poles at a higher or lower degree. And something that is also very important to rescue is that we're going to have uh, a definition of the cost of the implementation of uh, this uh, strategy for decarbonization when it comes to economic growth, uh, inclusion, decarbonization, infrastructure. And we're going to have an estimate to define the necessary action in order to come up with this uh, proposal. So we, this way we can talk about the social and economic impact and uh, to define all the fundamental things that we must uh, consider. First, COVID took us by surprise during uh, the design of this strategy. However, the implication of uh, COVID were considered to define the necessary action for the planning long term. And we also define the interventions uh, to position Costa Rica towards a sustainable recovery. And these interventions were aligned with the recommendations of uh, institutions uh, such as uh, the ones that are going to establish some general guidelines. So human capital development and um, small and medium size companies, the use of technologies, communications towards the fourth industrial revolution, incentives for decarbonization, green infrastructure, investment to support vulnerable groups in society, and to be able to transition towards a digital economic model are also key aspects for recovery and the central axis as part of this group of actions that are going to be established as a part of this strategy. And um, this strategy is part of a mandate, as I said in the beginning, in order to come up with the national strategic plan and the roadmap proposal and diagnosis that are going to tell us that the situation that we are in in 2021 and where we're headed for 2050 as part of this uh, general guidelines uh, focused on the different development poles through the implementation of these actions. And this is the input for the preparation of the National Strategic Plan. And this is what we need to do at the Ministry of Planning and Economic Policy. You have 30 seconds. And this is part of the different uh, instruments. And the idea is to try to position the different uh, actors of the civil society. And this is the way in which we can coordinate the future plans in the short term to be a part of this and to be reference for this roadmap. Thank you. Thank you. So starting from the 3D 
the most interesting thing for me is that uh, it, it reaffirms what we have to do economically without risking the economic stability and without leaving behind the vulnerable population. This is vital. The principles that you have carried out since the implementation process as well as from the design process. Because at the end of the day, this uh, makes us to be more resilient. This understanding that we are listening to from uh, our colleagues from Costa Rica, now that we have Oligario, and maybe in other countries, we are still on a uh, more uh, initial phase. However, the different cooperation partners all over the world are offering interesting opportunities to support the countries that still need more guidance in the process. I would like now to communicate to Amanda McKee for her to talk a little bit about how countries can make a better use of uh, everything uh, to uh, move to the most sustainable uh, aspects. And also I'd like you to talk about the support process uh, being provided by NDC partnership in the process, and also to introduce the concept of embedded advisor and the countries we are supporting. Great, thank you, David. And, and thank you, GIZ, for bringing us together for this event. Um, really glad to be joining some of our partners on, on this panel. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit um, more broadly in the region, specifically on some of the support that we're providing and how countries are approaching green recovery and climate action. Um, and then we're fortunate to have actually one of our um, embedded advisors from St. Lucia who's going to speak after me. So really to start, the NDC Partnerships mission focuses on supporting countries to plan and update their NDCs and to continually raise their climate ambitions. However, we, I think we all know that economic recovery and climate action are not mutually exclusive goals. Um, they go hand in hand. On the one hand, there, there are some trade-offs that we're seeing as countries are working to urgently respond to health and economic crises. They're also seeing dwindling political attention to and diversion of financial resources from climate action. On the other hand, we're also seeing lots of opportunities to actually link the economic recovery agenda development plans with climate action plans through the NDC. Um, we saw this through the partnership last May um, when we surveyed our developing country members at the, at the start of the, the COVID crisis. And based on the feedback that we received from 68 countries, we launched what we're calling our Economic Advisory Initiative, and this launched in June of last year. So this initiative really aims to support governments to integrate climate action into their COVID-19 recovery plans, specifically by embedding economic advisors into ministries of finance and planning. So ensuring that climate is part of that discussion. We are working to embed more than 50 advisors in 34 of our developing country members. And this is being done through, through the direct support of 15 of our, our members. To date, already 24 of those advisors have been deployed in 17 countries, um, and the rest will be deployed very, very shortly. So the exact scope of work of each of these advisors really varies according to the country's needs. But we have two broad categories of, of support that are being provided. The first is on economic planning. And so this is support focused on incorporating climate resilient growth into COVID-19 economic recovery responses and helping to ensure that there's alignment of recovery plans with the, the current and the updated NDCs. The second type of support is around climate finance. So this is focused on identifying climate financing projects and initiatives, developing resource mobilization strategies, um, and also establishing related financial instruments and mechanisms. So I wanna talk specifically about the Central American and Caribbean region, um, where we are supporting nine advisors in six countries. So that includes Antigua and Barbuda, Costa Rica, Jamaica, St. Lucia, Grenada, and the Dominican Republic. Um, we have advisors all over the world. Um, there's, another, there's another 
five um, that we're supporting in the larger LAC region. Um, and within the region, um, this support specifically is being provided through the World Bank, through the UK government, the World Resources Institute, Germany, through BMU, BMZ, GIZ, and also through Euroclima Plus. So this is really a, a representation of, of the partnership. Looking specifically at some of the some of the support that they're providing, most of these advisors are still in the early stages of implementation, but we're starting to see and learn on some of the ranges of approaches that countries are taking towards linking uh, COVID recovery in their, their climate agendas. So although we see countries use lots of different terminologies and approaches, and we've heard a lot of that referenced already on, on this call, um, green recovery, build back better, green growth, all of the countries who are receiving support are planning to incorporate climate action into their COVID-19 recovery responses. So that's something that we see across the board. So for instance, in Colombia, um, we'd see the government developing a national green recovery strategy. Um, in Jamaica, the advisor is assisting with the development of a medium term recovery plan and reviewing outputs from initial impact assessments to really identify and recommend alignment of the recovery plan with the NDC. And that includes costing of NDC actions um, to, achieve, to achieve the climate targets. Um, if we look at this early work that's being conducted by the advisors, we also see some common themes across sectors and themes. Um, so we see a lot of support being provided in the areas of sustainable infrastructure, urban development, agriculture, circular economy, bio, bio economy. Um, the last type of support that I really wanted to highlight um, is, is around preparation of project pipelines, um, mobilization of climate finance, development of fiscal policies, and instruments as, as part of the support that's being provided. So as many developing countries face major fiscal challenges as a result of the pandemic, including record deficits, public debt levels, the economic advisors who are embedded specifically within ministries of finance and planning are helping to better integrate climate adaptation and mitigation into these existing investment processes and helping to deploy new fiscal policies and instruments that can meet these dual, these dual goals. So I, I just have two um, country examples that I wanted to share on this. The first is that in Grenada, we have an economic investment advisor that will be supporting the country really in achieving its GHG emission reduction targets by assessing the impact of the new macroeconomic situation that the country faces as a result of the COVID crisis and how that's impacting their climate agenda. So looking at the links between that, they'll also be identifying and incorporating costed measures and shovel ready projects for NDC actions into the stimulus package. Um, and the last thing that the advisor will be looking at is supporting the design of fiscal instruments that can stimulate green growth, um, things like guarantees, venture capital, uh, regranting, green bonds, tax credits. Um, the other example I wanted to share is in Antigua and Barbuda. And here we actually have three advisors um, that have been deployed because there's three specific skill sets that the government was looking for support on. But they're supporting the government to develop a national climate budget tracking and reporting system. Um, and in addition to this, also supporting with actual capacity building for line ministries and departments, providing training to identify climate action in all stages of the project cycle for government projects. So there's an important capacity building element that's taking place here as well. All of these advisors that are being deployed are, are short term in nature. The, the support is starting immediately. It's meant to last for, for no more than a year to ensure that we're really um, taking this, the I guess the time that we have now or the opportunity that we have now when we're looking at recovery plans, we're looking at climate actions and integrating those. Um, the, 
the last thing I wanted to mention, just in addition to the advisors themselves, and this might be of interest to participants on the call, we've also launched a thematic expert group. And this is a, a free virtual online service um, where our developing country members can request support from the partnership members. We have 16 of our members who are ready to provide dedicated support through this service. Um, but they can request specific sectoral or thematic support to help them to really shape their COVID-19 recovery responses. Um, so to give you one example um, from, from the region, Ecuador um, has recently submitted a request and they'll be receiving support from um, GIZ and FAO to identify and learn from international approaches, actions and experiences on green recovery responses to see how they can align this with the Paris Agreement goals and the SDGs. So really through this um, or through the NDC partnerships economic advisory initiative, we're seeing that while governments are focusing on different priority areas and investments, really depending on the local context, there are a wide um, range of opportunities for making better use of recovery spending to really accelerate the transition to a sustainable and more equitable world. Um, but I'll leave it at that and back over to you, David. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amanda. And I would like to go in this same line with, uh, with Philip because he is one of the embedded advisors. Now he is supporting the government of St. Lucia. And although it's a very um, in, uh, initiative that is starting right now in, in there, I would like to raise the, the question about how has your experience has, as embedded advisor been so far? And what are the expectations and the milestones you plan to achieve with this support? Um, it's a very honor to have you here and please go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you, David. Um, I really would like to thank the course organizers for inviting me. Uh, I feel honored to be on this um, discussion panel. I believe it's an excellent um, opportunity for exchange and learning and sharing experiences. Um, I guess before, you know, sharing my own experiences, I just wanted to give some context and background on St. Lucia so you can have a better appreciation and understanding of the work that I'm doing. And in terms of St. Lucia, it's a small island development state. Um, it's, it's actually had very weak economic growth over the last decade, just about 1%. Um, tourism centric economy, uh, travel and tourism accounting up to about, about for about 50% of GDP, highly vulnerable to natural disasters. And um, with COVID, the economy you could imagine has been tremendously impacted. Um, GDP has estimated to have contracted by about 18%. The debt to GDP has moved from about just under 60% to 85%. Unemployment has increased significantly. We don't really have the latest numbers, but given that it's really tourism centric, we, you know, the, the yes, you know, our um, thinking is that these numbers may have moved from just under 20% to maybe over 30%. Uh, expenditures have increased um, for the health sector related to COVID and other cash and income transfers, and there have been widening fiscal deficits. So that's really the context in which um, um, the support is being provided by the economic advisor. And one of the first tasks that I had to look at, as Amanda said, is to really look at the economic recovery and resilience package, which the government um, actually approved uh, around July, which um, uh, COVID really started impacting San Lucia around March. And the idea here was to see to what extent can um, climate resilience be incorporated in this disaster relief response. In addition, I've been asked to lend support to the NDC revision implementing partners, which um, 
the government has uh, as part under the climate action enhancement package to develop the revised NDC and the, the, the goal here was to develop a finance and implementation strategy for the revised NDC to look at to examine the impact of COVID-19 in relation to national growth and development and how um, this has also impacted the medium-term development strategy and also to look at longer-term actions for ensuring economic resilience and sustainable development. So these are some of the areas that I have been asked to support and that support is being provided within the context of a number of uh, different interventions that the government has pursued. One is, as I indicated, uh, the medium term development strategy, which was only approved in July 2020, so just before I came on board. Um, there is also an ongoing World Economic Forum support for developing a country financing roadmap for the SDGs. Um, that, the, the report has been finalized, but there is still quite a bit of work going on on the roadmap for developing a financing roadmap for the SDGs. Um, the Economic Recovery and Resilience Plan, and um, as I indicated, um, a financing strategy and implementation plan for the revised NDCs. Um, in terms of St. Lucia's focus on the green economy and low carbon growth, that um, focus has been primarily energy centric um, uh, because the, 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 uh, I guess the, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, um, energy, uh, energy is a, a major source of it and the focus has been on um, attempting to reach, increase the percentage of energy coming from renewable energy sources and just to give you a sense of what the energy consumption levels are in St. Lucia now, as a percentage of imports, fossil fuels account for about 25% of imports and around three to 6% of GDP, depending on where oil market prices are. And the continued reliance on fossil fuels has created high and volatile costs of producing electricity, which leaves the country extremely vulnerable to a single source of energy. Um, in terms, St. Lucia has actually just submitted its revised NDC that was done in January of 2021. And the target that St. Lucia set for its NDC was really mitigation centric and targets a 7% reduction in greenhouse gases in 20. 30 relative to a baseline of 2010. As I indicated, the focus is really on the energy and transportation sectors. And St. Lucia has set some targets of achieving a 35% renewable energy yeah, by 2025 and 50% by 2030. Just to indicate how ambitious this is, St. Lucia only produces about 0.2% of its electricity from renewable energy sources. So, you know, there's quite a bit of work to be done in terms of meeting those targets. Um, the benefits of pursuing this strategy are numerous. One is that um, all of the, the available studies that have been done in St. Lucia has actually undertaken a national energy transition strategy, which shows that pursuing uh, a mix of energy sources, solar, wind and geothermal, that these costs in the medium to long term will be actually lower than pursuing um, a business as usual scenario with fossil fuels. Of course, there will be other benefits, reduce, uh, reducing foreign exchange outflows, reducing energy price volatility and improving energy security. So these are major benefits that, um, that would flow from pursuing that approach. I must say that um, as my early experiences would show is that it has been a bit of a challenge in terms of the transitioning. One is when, you know, the, I, I guess the earlier um, studies showed that St. Lucia's 
like many of other countries, the economic recovery and resilience package was essentially business as usual in approach. In fact, there was actually no um, allocations or programs for climate resilient projects. It was actually based on, um, um, it was infrastructure driven construction. The, the focus one was on having a construction driven economic recovery package. And um, given St. Lucia's um, fiscal situation, most of these projects were actually funded by mal multilateral and bilateral sources. So the extent to which you could um, trade off and be flexible in approach in terms of moving funds, um, that, that didn't prove possible because many of those projects took years to negotiate and actually um, uh, there would have been significant challenges in attempting to trade off there because of the, the delays in actually um, repurposing those particular, um, uh, I guess, loans and concessional funding that was actually provided. So the, the, e, the economic recovery and resilience package, well, there was very little that could be done and um, the government um, has actually uh, focused on um, moving ahead with this construction driven economic recovery. I, I guess. Philip, you have 30 seconds left. Yes, yeah, so in terms of uh, how I see um, us moving forward, um, I, what I can see is that the big constraints that Lucia has is developing alternative financing op options to fund renewable energy investments, public-private partnerships, blended finance, green bonds, um, increasing and scaling up concessional funds from other international climate funds like the Green Climate Fund, improving the legislative, regulatory and policy frameworks for the energy sector, and revising the medium-term strategy to incorporate the green economy, for example, greening the tourism sector, the agricultural sector, and bringing on ICT in a bigger way. And finally, securing the greater buy-in of the Ministry of Finance on developing a green economy and low carbon growth. I think this here is a big challenge and needs to be considered. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias, Philip. Este, efectivamente, es un eh, reto enorme para todos los países hacer esto. So it is a big challenge for the countries to do so. In order to conclude this space, because it's very interesting, there are many things to say, many things to discuss, but time is our biggest enemy right now. So I would like to go to one of the questions we have on the chat and I consider uh, relevant before closing this uh, uh, panel because we see the examples we have been listening from the different interventions. Uh, something that is quite relevant to discuss here, to be discussed here is, well, not all this is uh, good. We always need to plan thinking that we have movements and stakeholders that oppose the processes. There is a concrete question in the chat uh, for Mr. Olegario. So Olegario, I'll ask you to answer as concretely as possible to avoid taking more time from other colleagues. I would like to know, according to Juliana Montenegro, she asks, what are the main stakeholders of opposition to the development model in Costa Rica and how you overcome their adversity within the political economy in the country? Great question, Olegario, be as concrete as possible. The question is quite relevant. However, we need to remember something which is very important. The strategy uh, acts as a, an assessment. What is the situation, condition, and what is the proposal? Now we need to work, as I said at the end, we need to work in the plan and in development, developing the plan will consider as main input the strategy. But what happens now? We need to reach consensus at the level of the different stakeholders, political stakeholders, regional stakeholders, and to do so, the national planning system in Costa Rica has the regional uh, development uh, councils that will uh, lead to articulate in the different regions all these proposals. This is a way. Another way is 
the interaction of the planning ministry or political parties with the academia, which is vital within this uh, proposal. So we need to involve the set of the different stakeholders, political, social, ac the academia, private companies, uh, chambers, uh, for them to become familiar with the plan and to interiorize it in order to give continuity through the different administrations. I believe this is the main aspect, uh, but it is broader than that. The question is also if the civil society is included as well. Yes, civil society plays a vital role. We are talking about the participation through different forums that the Ministry of Planning will organize under the framework of all this uh, uh, pandemic issue. But yes, civil society will play a very important role. The most uh, pertinent here is to think on this new development model, uh, will that benefit the country, the faraway uh, territories? It benefits everybody in terms of the uh, proposal. Why people uh, will not think that uh, an outline that is proposing an improvement for their life is not a better things to implement. So this is the point. The strategy offers a view quite new about the possible development of the country in the medium and long term. So it is a project, a country project. Remember that. Thank you. In the general chat, you are seeing the link where you can uh, check, consult the strategy and the three phases of the strategy, three very interesting documents to read and to revise. Uh, as Olegario explained, the scientific background and how it was created. Let me see if you have any other question. No, I don't think so. So with that, uh, I want to thank the panelists for your great interventions. Time is our biggest enemy, although this space will be will give possibilities to speak much more, but we hope we're going to have another space to do so on my behalf and on behalf of Climate Action Project. It has been a great pleasure and honor for me to moderate this panel. We hope to see you n soon next time. Thank you. Good morning. And I give the floor to the moderator of the session, Mr. Stefan Mayer. Thank you, David. Thank you, Oligario, Agrippina, Amanda, and Philip for this uh, quite interesting panel that was joining a little bit uh, uh, it was uh, reuniting while well, we started talking with the concept uh, and to see the little bit about the support required. So it gives a little bit of this concept. Looking at the time, uh, uh, I would like to invite you right now the uh, uh, evaluation of the event is enabled already. So you go in this uh, voice boxer tool for you to participate. Please that help us to improve this uh, type of webinars for the future and to see a little bit uh, uh, about the content uh, we are offering. So please answer these three to five questions that we have right there. Thank you for the presentations. We have seen that this green recovery is based on a development, and there are bases that we can use. We need to revise concepts, plans, strategies. Also, looking at the current economic situation, but we're not alone. This is a global challenge, uh, to say so, with different experiences, uh, uh, support programs uh, that support in different manners, as we have seen, uh, the PAGE initiative, 
the better uh, program. I believe there is a lot of information. There is enough information available for those of you who would like to open this view, this general view, and to exchange uh, practices uh, at the international level. This is also the idea of this uh, space, the webinar. I mean, to gather and to generate this contact uh, between you working uh, for a green recovery in the region. Uh, for this to be really green and sustainable on time and not something punctual. And I believe with this, we have seen several examples today. On my behalf, I want to thank you for your participation, for your questions, your presentations and from my panelists and speakers at the beginning. Thanks to the team that is behind of the organization of this webinar from uh, Climate Action Project, uh, the interface of Project TK in the region. And the, I would like, uh, with this, I would like to close the space. So please answer the questions uh, of the survey, which is important for the our evaluation. And see you very soon in one of the new webinars. Uh, that uh, will be programmed or scheduled this year. Thank you, everybody. Have a nice day. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Have a nice day.